Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Royal Society. My name is Paul Nurse. I'm president um, of the Society. That's Britain's Academy of Science and the oldest science academy in the world. Um, we are here today to discuss shale gas. It's an important issue, obviously, for the UK, for the UK's economy, and also for climate change. The centrepiece will be a speech by the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, Ed Davey MP, and I'd very much like to welcome him here today for that speech. He will be talking, is shale gas the new North Sea? The myths and realities of shale gas exploration. After his speech, uh, this will be followed by responses from our three panelists who are already here um, on the podium. That is David Kennedy, Chief Executive of the Committee on Climate Change, Doug Parr, Chief Scientist at Greenpeace, and Hal Thomas, FRS and FRNG, who was a, a member of the Royal Society Royal Academy of Engineering Shale Gas Report. And I'll say a, mo a little about that in a moment. After their responses, and they may not, of course, all agree with the minister. We'll have to see about that. Um, we will have um, a question and answer session with the audience. And we have a, an accomplished and wide-ranging audience here um, for about a half an hour. Now, before I ask um, the minister to speak, I'd like to make a few opening remarks about um, the shale gas issue. Now, shale gas um, exploitation is obviously complex and clearly requires a multidisciplinary approach. It has to cover a lot of bases um, to um, deal with the issue. Some of the issues were covered by a joint uh, Royal Academy of Engineering and Royal Society report last year, which focused on the science and engineering evidence, mainly with respect to groundwater contamination and earth tremors. The main finding of that study was that the health, safety, and local environmental risks associated with fracking can be managed effectively in the UK as long as, and I quote, operational best practices are implemented and enforced through regulation. The report did not analyze risks associated with subsequent use of shale gas, including um, impact on uh, greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. However, a study led by David Mackay, FRS, um, the chief uh, scientific advisor to DEC, and I think I spotted him in the audience just there, um, uh, will tackle some of these issues and this report has been or um, will be published today. I think it's already been reported. Isn't that right, David? Yeah. So, uh, and that takes account of some of the issues that the earlier report did not um, cover. And it is um, clearly important um, in considering whether shale gas extraction should go ahead and to what extent to take account of all these different issues that are involved. Now, the Royal Society... Um, a year or two ago, published a report on risk, and that report argued that crises of technology are not always about the risk of the technology involved. People's concerns are more wide-ranging and involve more value-based questions beyond the science and the scientific um, estimations and measurements of risk. So this is why I was emphasizing um, a, a complex problem involving science, but also, of course, involving more wider societal issues. So with that background, it's my pleasure to welcome the Secretary of State, Ed Davey, to tackle these complex issues. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a real honour to be here at the Royal Society uh, today. Uh, for over 350 years, uh, the Society has served the common good. Your charter, updated and approved by the Queen just last year, tasks the Royal Society to ensure that the light of science and learning shines conspicuously. Not just among our own people, but the length of the whole world, to be a patron of every kind of truth. 
And it's because of your rich history, your reputation for independence, your dedication to the scientific method, that people turn to the Royal Society for understanding when confronted with new and complex challenges. That is why last year, the government's former chief scientific advisor, Sir John Beddington, asked the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering to review the scientific and engineering evidence on the advances being made in shale gas extraction, as we have just uh, heard. This technology of hydraulic fracturing, popularly known as fracking, has seen some advances, and it needs to be studied carefully. He asked you, Sir John Bennington asked you, to make recommendations to ensure exploration in the UK could proceed safely and extraction be managed effectively. Recommendations based on the scientific evidence to ensure that the way forward is informed by fact and not by myth. And on behalf of the government, I accepted the recommendations of your report in full. And today I want to talk about the progress we've made in implementing them, but I also want to take this opportunity to address other concerns that have been raised and to set shale gas in the context of Britain's overall energy strategy. There's been quite a debate uh, about shale gas over the summer. Uh, and if you took at face value some of the claims made about fracking, such as being the exaggeration and misunderstanding, you would be forgiven for thinking that it represents a great evil. One of the gravest threats that have ever existed to the environment, to the health of our children, and to the future of the planet. On the other side of the coin, you could have been led to believe that shale gas is the sole answer to all our energy problems. That we can turn our backs on developing renewables and nuclear, safe in the knowledge that shale gas will meet all our energy needs. Of course, both of these positions are just plain wrong. I understand the concerns that people have that shale gas extraction could be taken forward irresponsibly and without proper protections. I stand shoulder to shoulder with those who want to tackle climate change. Just as I stand shoulder to shoulder with those who want to keep our homes warm and our businesses powered at a price people can afford. But our society is ill-served when we allow myths to proliferate or when we allow debates to be hijacked by zealots or vested interests. So today I want to make the calm, rational, objective case for shale gas exploration in the UK and in the light of the three equal and overarching objectives I have as Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change. First, powering the country, keeping the lights on, planning properly to meet our future energy needs. Second, protecting the planet, cutting carbon emissions and preserving our environment, being responsible guardians of our children's inheritance. And third, making sure the whole of society benefits from the exploitation of energy resources, revenues, growth and jobs, and of course, affordable bills. And I guess my main message to you today is this. UK shale gas can be developed sensibly and safely, protecting the local environment, with the right regulation. And we can meet our wider climate change goals uh, and our targets at the same time with the right policies in place. Gas, as the cleanest fossil fuel, is part of the answer to climate change as a bridge in our transition to a green future, especially in our move away from coal. Gas will buy us the time we need over the coming decades to get enough low carbon technology up and running so we can power the country and keep cutting emissions. We have to face it. The North Sea gas production is falling and we are becoming increasingly reliant on gas imports. So UK shale gas could increase our energy security by cutting those imports. Homegrown gas, just like homegrown renewables and new nuclear, also provides jobs for our people and tax revenues for our society. Taking all this together, shale gas could have significant benefits. But let me be equally clear, shale gas is no quick fix and no silver bullet. First, we must make sure that the rigorous regulation we are putting in place is followed to the letter to protect the local environment. Second, we must pursue vigorously the development and deployment 
of mitigation and abatement technologies like carbon capture and storage to protect the planet. And third, frankly, we are at the very early stages of onshore shale gas exploration in the UK. We may have been fracking in Britain's offshore waters for years. The US may have been fracking onshore for years. But in Britain, fracking for onshore, onshore gas in shale at any significant scale is something new. Nobody can say for sure how much onshore UK shale gas resource exists or how much of it can be commercially extracted. So let's be cautious about the hyperbole on shale. For it would likely be the 2020s before we might feel any benefits in full. So we simply can't bank on shale gas to solve all our energy challenges today or this decade. And in the next decade, shale by itself will not come close to solving even our basic energy resource security challenge. But the promising news is that UK shale gas could be a key and valuable resource as part of a more diverse energy mix, especially as the production of North Sea gas declines in the future. And it will do so alongside conventional gas, wind, wave, biomass, nuclear, carbon capture and storage, and all the other low carbon technologies that must contribute. We won't know any of this for sure until proper exploration takes place. So it's in the national interest to move on from the arguments of zealots and vested interests and start a debate about how best to proceed safely with shale gas exploration where we maximise the real positive benefits and minimise the inevitable negative impacts. And today I wanted to start that debate beginning with that first objective I set out, powering the country. And to do that, I have to tell the story of gas in Britain. Over the last 45 years, the extraction of both oil and gas from the North Sea has contributed around £300 billion in production taxes to the Treasury, with hundreds of thousands of jobs across the country. Today, our society annually consumes around 70 billion cubic metres of gas. Roughly a quarter of that is used in electricity generation, and nearly all the rest is used for cooking our food and heating our buildings. And gas has advantages for those tasks. It is flexible and ready available. Gas is much better for the environment than coal when generating electricity with half the carbon footprint. As our comprehensive 40-year carbon plan sets out, a plan that meets our ambitious climate change objectives, gas will continue to play a role right through to 2050. And over the next two decades or more, gas in the power sector will support our ability to reduce carbon emissions while we develop low carbon alternatives for electricity. For by 2030, none of Britain's electricity must come from unabated coal, a dramatic shift. Instead, it must come from some mixture of renewable generation, nuclear and gas, in proportions decided in the world's first low-carbon electricity market this coalition government is establishing. But with gas fueled electricity predicted to have a significant market share. And if carbon capture and storage technology can be successfully deployed, gas will continue to play a major role in power generation into the 2030s and beyond. So Britain will continue to need gas for power, for heating and for cooking but North Sea reserves are diminishing. We expect net North Sea gas production to fall from a peak of 108 billion cubic metres at the turn of the century to perhaps 19 billion cubic metres by 2030. We will miss that gas and the tax revenues it brings and the jobs given the level of employment supported today by offshore gas production. And less North Sea gas means, as I've said, greater reliance on imports. In 2003, we were a net exporter of gas, but by 2025, we expect to be importing close to 70% of the gas we consume. How we get gas matters. Now, there is a big debate at the moment about Britain's energy security. And like the shale gas debate, it is characterised by myth and misinformation. 
Over the next six months, I intend to make a series of speeches that I hope will counter that and reassure people that the problems the coalition inherited on all aspects of energy security are being fully addressed. But for today, it's important to realise that energy security has several aspects, from having sufficient electricity generation capacity to having the networks for delivering gas, electricity and transport fuel reliably across the country. The role of gas in the UK's energy security story is the energy resource piece. Can Britain be sure of our raw fuel supplies? <coughs> and the good news is our energy resource security is actually very robust. There's been no major interruptions to gas supplies in recent history, partly of course because we have our own direct supplies currently from the North Sea, but also because we have reliable conventional pipe gas supplies from our friends in Norway and the Netherlands, and because the liquefied natural gas we import from Qatar and other suppliers has been dependable. Indeed, our capacity to import gas has increased fivefold in the past decade. So the UK has one of the largest and most liquid gas markets in Europe, giving us confidence about the short and medium term security of gas supply. But we cannot afford to be complacent. Global energy demand is already twice as high as it was 30 years ago, and the International Energy Agency estimates that it's set to grow by a third again by 2035. If we see rapid increases in global gas demand, to which supply cannot react quickly, or if we see disruptions in supply to which demand cannot react quickly, we will see price spikes and wider market instability. In 2005-06, for instance, the spike in UK gas prices can be partly attributed to a reduction in Russian supplies to Europe. Fears that a conflict in the Middle East would close the Straits of Hormuz can also set the markets jittering. You only have to look at the effect of recent crises in Libya or Syria to understand how global events can impact on the markets. So our solutions to energy resource security have to be robust and lasting, looking out to 2050 and beyond, alongside our decarbonisation timescales, in fact. For key to delivering energy security in the long term is making sure we have a diverse energy mix, not over-reliant on any one source or fuel, and much, much less reliant on fossil fuels and imported fuels. That's one of the many reasons I put such a great emphasis on renewable energy and energy efficiency investments as central to my energy strategy. By increasing indigenous homegrown energy production through renewables, <coughs> nuclear and lower carbon fossil fuels, and by using energy more wisely, we are seeking to cushion the country as far as possible from volatile global fuel prices. An onshore UK shale gas could play an important part in that strategy of planning long term for more homegrown diversity. By advancing shale gas production in the UK, we will achieve three things. First, we will displace a proportion of gas imports, increasing resilience and energy security. Second, there will be a benefit in terms of jobs, tax revenues and growth, mitigating some of the falling revenues from the North Sea. Better those jobs and tax revenues are in the UK rather than the countries from which we import. And third, we control the production so we control the carbon emissions created by production. Better those emissions are controlled within our rigorous carbon budget system than in other countries where controls may be more lax. So let me turn to those environmental issues. Your Royal Society report published last year with the Royal Academy of Engineering demonstrated that if regulated properly and with investment in safeguards, hydraulic fracturing can take place quite safely without hurting the local environment. It will not contaminate water supplies. It will not cause dangerous earthquakes. We have a long, strong tradition of civil engineering and mineral and energy extraction from coal in the 18th and 19th century, from oil and gas in the 20th, from renewables in the 21st, we are skilled, practised and vastly experienced with some of the tightest safety and environmental regulations in the world. But onshore shale gas extra exploration and production 
could genuinely become a significant new industry for the UK. So the same scientific rigour, methodical engineering and stringent safeguards that have been applied elsewhere must be applied to shale. We must make sure that the recommendations of the Royal Society made in your report are in place and the regulations we have imposed are followed to the letter. As you proposed, we have now set up the Office of Unconventional Gas and Oil to coordinate the cross-government work on shale gas and oil. Planning regulations under the Department of Communities and Local Government. Environmental safeguarding carried out by the Environment Agency under DEFRA. And of course, the licensing and consent procedures carried out by my own department. We have introduced the traffic light system you proposed to reduce the risk of seismic tremors. Environmental risk assessment guidance will be published this autumn. And the research councils have agreed in principle to fund a joint responsible innovation study to consider further work. These may be early days for onshore shale gas exploration, but I'm determined we have tough regulations in place from the start. The public rightly expect that. And then we will still need to continue to develop our systems as the industry evolves. The Environment Agency, for example, is considering the best way to ensure groundwater monitoring for when exploration takes off. We're looking at ways to pilot methane emissions monitoring with industry. And we are working to ensure there's a formal mechanism for operators to share information about any problems they are encountering and how they can be overcome. My department met with the Royal Society recently to look at progress and we will continue to seek your advice. But there has remained a gap in our knowledge in relation to the impact of UK shale gas extraction on greenhouse gas emissions. Today I've published the report I commissioned in December last year from DEX Chief Scientist Professor David Mackay and Dr Timothy Stone into the carbon footprint of UK produced shale gas. I want to thank them publicly for that report. The report concludes that with the right safeguards in place, the net effect on national emissions from UK shale gas production will be relatively small when compared to the use of other sources of gas. Indeed, emissions from production and transport of UK shale gas would likely be lower than the imported liquefied natural gas that it would replace. The continued use of gas is perfectly consistent with our carbon budgets over the next couple of decades. If shale gas production does reach significant levels, we will need to make extra efforts in other areas, because by onshoring production, we will be onshoring the emissions as well. And as this report recommends, we will still need to put in place a range of mitigation and abatement techniques. I strongly welcome these very sensible recommendations, and we will be responding positively and in detail shortly. But the report from Professor Mackay and Dr Stone puts another piece of the puzzle in place. It should help reassure environmentalists like myself that we can safely pursue UK shale gas production and meet our national emissions reduction targets designed to help tackle climate change. Of course, in terms of global emissions, the only way we're going to address the very real danger that rising global energy demand results in ever rising global carbon emissions is through a binding international agreement on how to tackle climate change. This has to st stand at the centre of any climate change strategy. Climate change is the greatest long-term threat that humankind currently faces. A threat that is proven, growing, and already impacting on the way we live. So it is right that we consider how the exploitation of new fossil fuel reserves will impact on this process. Would the imported LNG that UK shale gas is likely to replace just create extra emissions elsewhere? Or will it displace more damaging coal generation elsewhere? One of the unfortunate side effects of UK shale gas production has been the dumping of US coal on international markets. But I believe that if we can encourage a global move from coal to gas, we will be doing the planet a favour. China has overtaken the US as the world's biggest polluter mainly because of the massive amounts of coal they burn. A Chinese switch from coal to gas, as is happening in the US, will make it easier to cut global emissions in the short and medium term as the low carbon revolution picks up pace. If shale gas can contribute to weaning the world off more damaging coal, then we should not fear it. 
From an environmental point of view, we should welcome it. Let me be clear though, here at home, we must not and will not allow shale gas production to compromise our focus on boosting renewables, nuclear and other low carbon technologies. UK shale gas production must not be at the expense of our wider environmental aims. Indeed, if done properly, it will support them and I'm determined to make that happen. With the market reforms enacted by the Energy Bill currently going through Parliament, we can attract the investment we require to develop technologies across the mix we need, from wind to nuclear shale gas to carbon capture and storage. As I've said, the future of gas in the long term will rely on technology like carbon capture and storage. And the UK government is committed to CCS head, heart and wallet. We have selected the Peterhead project and the White Rose project chosen as preferred bidders under our one billion commercialization competition. And the 125 million pound research and development program is supporting a hundred different projects, testing knowledge in all areas of the CCS pipeline from technology to transportation to the supply chain. So I'm excited by the prospect of Britain leading the world on carbon capture and storage because cracking this technology and making it cost effective will open up a host of new options in tackling climate change. That is why we need to plan properly for our future. And that includes thinking about how we use the potential proceeds from shale gas. When North Sea oil and gas production was at its height, tax revenues were used for current spending and not reinvested. In, con in contrast, countries like Norway and countries in the Middle East have used oil and gas tax revenues to create sovereign wealth funds which invest for the future. If onshore shale gas production takes off, if our country gets another major fossil fuel tax revenue boost, I want us to be a country that invests for the future, a low carbon future using shale gas revenues. My party at its conference next Sunday will be discussing how we can best transition to a zero carbon Britain by 2050. One policy proposal before our party conference is that a low carbon transition fund is established from some of the tax revenues from any future shale gas production. I think that is absolutely the right thing to do. Shale gas production can and must be used to transition to a low carbon future. In this way, the benefits of future shale gas production can be felt not just by this generation, but by future generations too. So let me now turn to the third of my objectives of Secretary of State, making sure the whole of our society benefits from the exploitation of energy resources. Here in the UK, we are at the very early stages of shale gas exploration. The British Geological Society is methodically investing, investigating the geology. This is beginning to give us some idea of the size of the resource. The Boland Shale Study suggests a large rock volume potentially filled with some 37 trillion cubic feet of gas. But the geology also makes for challenging extraction. In some areas, the shale is 10,000 feet thick. There is just no way of knowing how much gas can be physically extracted and how it will flow. And crucially, there's no way of knowing how much can be extracted at a commercially viable rate. That is why we've put in place the right incentives for exploration to take place and for a domestic industry to develop so that we can make those judgments more clearly. But let's just look at one possible scenario. In May, the Institute of Directors produced a report based on available evidence. They conclude that on central estimate, Britain's shale gas production could potentially peak at around 32 billion cubic metres per year. The industry could support around 70,000 jobs directly in the supply chain and in the wider economy. Significant production could have a benign effect on wholesale prices. And the production would, of course, provide a net benefit to the Treasury in terms of tax revenue. It is plain common sense that we pursue the shale possibility if we can realise such benefits without jeopardising our environment. So, is onshore shale gas Britain's new North Sea? Well, the 32 billion cubic metres a year of shale gas production estimated by the IOD 
at peak will be less than a third of peak North Sea gas output. In reality, it could be much more, I hope so, but it could also be much less. Regardless, it would still be valuable, especially if we can keep the North Sea running longer, perhaps with more offshore fracking. Any shale gas tax revenues could offset some of the revenue reduction we are already seeing from our North Sea asset. Shale gas could displace some gas imports, but even with shale gas in full production, Britain is likely to remain significantly import dependent. So there will be very real and tangible benefits from shale gas, but let us not get carried away. The basic fact is we just don't know exactly what amounts of gas are under our feet and how much of that gas we can commercially and safely extract. And that is why we can't quantify precisely the effect that UK shale gas production will have on UK prices. It's far from clear that UK shale gas production could ever replicate the price effects seen in the US. The situation is different here. We don't have the wide open landscapes of Texas or Dakota. Just one of the areas producing shale gas in the United States, the so-called Marcellus Play, has a productive use of roughly 95,000 square miles. That is the same size as the whole of the United Kingdom. The Boland Shale, the largest potential shale gas area in the UK, is just 500 square miles, almost 200 times smaller. Of course, this is just a two-dimensional example, but it gives you a sense of the scale. And it's not just the geology, or the population density, or the environmental regulations, or the planning laws that are different. The US has a closed gas market. Massive increases in supply naturally affect prices. But we are part of the European market. We source energy from far and wide, and we compete against others for the supply. And gas produced in the UK is sold into this wider international market. When UK gas production in the North Sea was at its highest earlier this decade, UK and continental gas prices were still closely linked and fairly similar. North Sea gas didn't significantly move UK prices. So we can't expect UK shale production alone to have any effect. But given there are plenty of demand side upward pressures on gas prices, as we've seen so painfully in recent years, shale gas is well worth pursuing simply to have more supply side downward pressures on prices. For if Britain can lead in Europe, if Britain can lead in Europe and can show a lead on how shale can be done safely, and as part of a complete shift away from coal, shale gas production might take off, not just in the UK, but across Europe. This would reduce the dependency of Europe as a whole on gas imports. And with Europe-wide shale gas production boosting supply, markets might really be impressed. Then we might see downward pressures on gas prices strong enough to offset fast rising demand. And frankly, after wholesale gas price rises of 50% in the last five years, the key and overriding reason behind today's high energy bills in Britain, any downward pressure that can be exerted on prices will be welcomed by consumers and industry alike. So ladies and gentlemen, the reality is shale gas has a role to play in meeting all the objectives I have set out. Keeping the lights on, tackling climate change, and helping keep energy affordable and the economy moving. On all these fronts, especially energy security, shale represents an exciting prospect. Even if the potential benefits are some way off, even if shale gas is not the new North Sea, it is a national opportunity. An opportunity it would be foolish to turn away from. An opportunity for homegrown energy resource that boosts security, an opportunity for investment, jobs and tax revenues. The bottom line is, we are going to need gas supplies for many decades to come as we move to the zero carbon Britain I'd like to see. As a bridge to that future, shale gas can help the UK and other countries transition to the low carbon energy system that we need if we are to limit climate change. On this crowded island, our communities matter, our environment matters. 
Energy production of all types has to be safe, an accepted part of the landscape. Exploration, development and production all need to be handled correctly and that is what we are doing. Shale gas will be developed responsibly. Britain can lead the way. We have the skills and expertise to lead in Europe, showing others how it can be done, protecting the environment, not wrecking it. And you at the Royal Society have helped to show us the way. Here at the Royal Society, in 1988, a seminal speech was made by a seminal British Prime Minister. Even though action to tackle carbon emissions may involve upfront costs, she argued, and I quote, I believe it to be money well and necessarily spent because the health of the economy and the health of our environment are totally dependent upon each other. By embracing the concept of green growth, Margaret Thatcher showed a lead not just to her party, not just to the country, but to the world. The coalition government agrees. And our approach to shale gas will meet <coughs> these twin responsibilities to the economy and to the environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Secretary of State. Um, I'm now going to ask our three panelists to um, respond with short comments about three minutes each. And I wonder whether we could start with you, David Kennedy. OK, thank you, Paul. Uh, Thank you, Ed, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to summarise in three minutes the position of my organisation on shale gas. And in a nutshell, we think uh, it does have a role potentially to play in a low carbon economy, but it's not a game changer uh, in terms of low carbon investment. So let me just explain very quickly why that's the case. Uh, a few months ago, we published a report on life cycle emissions, so the carbon footprint of various uh, fuels and low carbon and other technologies. And in that, we focused on shale gas and we considered the contention that uh, shale gas has actually a carbon footprint that is the same as coal, so uh, it cannot have part of a, uh, it cannot be part, sorry, of a, a low carbon energy system. Now, that is true if uh, the methane release during the process of getting the gas out of the ground is allowed to escape into the atmosphere, but there are well established operational practices to stop that happening. So the challenge is for the government to make sure that it doesn't happen. It's the challenge for the environmental agency as well to implement the regulations. Uh, if we can stop those fugitive emissions getting into the atmosphere, then I think David Mackay uh, came to a similar conclusion to us uh, that shale gas has similar emissions to natural gas and potentially lower emissions than LNG. So if we're going to use gas in the economy, which we will for the foreseeable future, why wouldn't you use uh, shale gas? It's not bad from a life cycle perspective if we have the right regulations in place. Moving on, uh, it's difficult economic times at the moment. Uh, people we know from survey evidence are very worried about their energy bills. And it's tempting to look across at America and say, well, look what shale gas has done there. It's caused gas prices to plummet. Uh, we'd love that to happen here. And then to say, well, it will happen here. I think that's been very careful not to claim that today. Uh, there are three things in America which are different uh, to the situation here. One, there's an abundance of shale gas such that that determines the market price. Two, uh, it is low cost to get out of the ground. And three, uh, there's a boom and bust cycle in that industry. And there's been overinvestment. We're in a bust at the moment, and the prices are very low in America. And even there, we would expect them to go up over time. Uh, as I say, it's very tempting then to look across at America and say, well, we would love that to happen here. It is highly unlikely to happen here uh, for any of those reasons. But in particular, there isn't enough shale gas in the UK and in Europe to change the European market price. And I think Ed referred to uh, an Institute of Directors report that said optimistically, uh, production could rise to 30 billion cubic metres a year. Now, that might sound a lot, but if you take the IEA projection for European gas demand in 2030, that's 600 billion cubic metres. Now, 30 billion cubic metres is not enough to change the price in a market with overall demand. That's 600 billion cubic metres. If you take European production, uh, the optimistic estimate from the IEA is that in Europe we could produce something like up to 80 billion cubic metres, which again is not enough to change the price of gas. So for us, shale gas is not a, a price changing story. Uh, it will have benefits potentially in terms of sovereignty, and we know that people value energy sovereignty very highly. Could have benefits in terms of employment, 
and tax revenues, but that's where the benefits are. So let's not confuse this with saying it's going to solve the affordability problem. It probably isn't, uh, but it could have wider benefits. And let me finish by saying, well, where might we use this shale gas? Uh, most of gas in this country is used for heating in our buildings and our industries. Uh, about 60% of gas consumed uh, in the country is for those purposes, about 40% for uh, generation of power. For the foreseeable future, and again, this underpins our advice on carbon budgets, uh, gas will continue to be the main source of energy for heat in our buildings and our industry. That's true not just for the 2010s, also for the 2020s, and even for the 2030s. And only as we get into the 2040s do we expect to see the dominant form of heat in buildings and industry become low carbon. So there is an ongoing role uh, for the use of gas. And again, if we can deal with the other issues around fugitive emissions, uh, potential earth tremors and water supply impacts, then why wouldn't you use uh, shale gas to meet that demand? But what it doesn't do, it doesn't change the power generation story. Uh, there's a lot of debate. Should we have a dash for gas like we had in the 1990s in power generation? And should we not invest in low carbon technologies? And again, Ed was very nuanced about this. He is not saying we should give up on the portfolio approach that we have in this country. But certainly, again, back in May this year, uh, we published a report on electricity market reform where we said, well, let's look at the impact of shale gas. Let's factor that into price projections. And let's look at the economic benefits of investing in a portfolio of low carbon technologies compared to uh, investing in gas fired generation. And there is still, in a shale gas world, a clear benefit moving to a low carbon power sector uh, sooner rather than later. And a figure there, we estimated the benefit of moving sooner rather than later to a low carbon power system where unabated gas only has a residual role by 2030, so meeting about 10% uh, of total generation, uh, we estimated a benefit of 50 to 100 billion pounds there. So early power sector carbonisation still makes sense uh, in uh, a low carbon world, uh, in a shale gas world, sorry. Let me finish where I started though. Uh, for the Committee on Climate Change, uh, we think there is a role for shale gas. If we can address the various concerns, there is a role for shale gas in a low carbon world, but it's not a game changer. Uh, in terms of low carbon investments. Thank you very much, David. Um, Doug. Mm. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks, Ed, for your uh, speech there. I think uh, um, some very helpful comments. Um, I'm going to uh, take a slightly broader view because I'm looking at climate change across the globe. Um, I still believe um, we need to hold climate change to a temperature rise of less than two degrees, widely recognized. Uh, international metric, which is agreed by governments. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, what we see across the globe is um, ambitious exploitation of new reserves of fossil fuels, whether that be the rush to the Arctic, try and find oil and gas there, the tar sands in Canada, the pre-salts in, uh, uh, in Brazil, and after the weekend, I'm afraid, probably more coal in Australia. So... Um, where does this rush for fossil fuels sit uh, within our ambition to contain uh, temperature rises to less than that of two degrees? Well, fortunately, the uh, International Energy Agency, the IEA, uh, an organisation founded and dedicated to exploiting hydrocarbons, more or less, um, concluded that by uh, 2050, um, we need to leave a lot of the existing proven reserves in the ground. And that includes gas. Their estimate, a report published earlier this year, is that half of, those, um, uh, half of those proven gas reserves need to go unexploited by 2050. Now, it is entirely unclear to me how digging up and finding more gas helps with that. And this is the reality of what living in a two degrees world actually means. It means that somewhere, somehow, at some place, we've got to stop. We've got to stop the tar sands, we've got to stop the Arctic, and I would contend we've got to stop finding unconventional gas. Someone has got to make that move. We're talking about the UK. We're an organ, uh, a country that is, I hope, still dedicated to low carbon power. We're a rich, developed country compared to most. So if we're not going to take that step, who is? How can we say to the Canadians, uh, no, 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 you can't have those tar sands. I think that's a really bad idea. Or to the Australians. <coughs> or to goodness knows how many, uh, how many countries that are 
um, looking at their own hydrocarbon reservoirs that we can't use if we're going to keep climate change with, with under that level that is widely recognized as a dangerous limit. That's the reality of where we are with climate change. We've got to stop finding and exploiting more fossil fuel reserves, including gas. Just to set that in context, um, I'm grateful to the Tyndall Center for uh, their estimate that 10% uh, of the uh, gas in place in the Voland Shale constitutes a, about 80% or more of the UK's carbon budget out to 2050. 80%. So most, and that doesn't include any, any coal we might burn, any oil we might burn, and I, I guess we're still going to be running around in petrol cars for a while. Um, so the size of the resource is still quite significant compared to our carbon budgets. And my concern is that once those hydrocarbons are investigated, exploited, they essentially become a lobby for their continued use. We don't have political institutions that are yet in a position to start closing down existing infrastructure, existing capital investment. I don't see it. And that to me means don't go there in the first place. There are indeed complicated arguments about how gas might, uh, might supplant coal. But I see no willingness, even across Europe, who are supposed to be leading the global fight on this, to put in place coal restrictions to allow gas to flourish. We might be in a different world if that was true, but I see no, I see no enthusiasm to do that. And therefore, I see UK shale gas, Polish shale gas, Ukrainian <coughs> shale gas, as simply adding to the amount of hydrocarbon that is going to be burned and creating a lobby for its burning. As there's been a lot of comment, let me make a separate comment now. Um, there has been quite a lot of comment about, uh, about fracking, as we've seen over the summer. The uh, Joint Academies report that was published uh, earlier this year said that uh, it can be done safely. Uh, it's technically feasible to do uh, shale gas in a safe way, and I would concur. Um, the trouble is, can is not the same as will. All sorts of things are technically feasible. Successful cross-departmental working. Well-managed IT projects, <laughs> balanced journalism. These are all technically feasible. It doesn't mean they're going to happen. Um, we've got an environment agency that's facing significant cuts to its core budget. We've got some uh, people in the government who are a lot keener than Ed is on, uh, on exploiting shale gas. Some of those who are in charge of those relevant agencies. And our current practice is that we have self-monitoring of many of the issues that, about which are concerning people about fracking. Um, and particularly with things like methane, where is there, there is essentially no traceability over the outcome of regulatory failure. That seems to me to be a recipe for, well, let's say significant concern. So I would argue, in conclusion, um, we have a significant problem with climate, and that means not exploiting hydrocarbon reserves, however tempting they may seem. <coughs> and so we shouldn't go there even, even despite the concerns that I think are valid about whether fracking and shale gas and other hydrocarbon reserves can or will be exploited safely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. How? Well, a great deal has been said about the report already, so I don't know that I need to take much time. But thank you, President. Thank you, Secretary of State. Um, as has been said, it's a, it was a Joint Academies report, and our main um, specification, if you like, was to look at um, seismicity and groundwater pollution. I have to say to you, the report pretty soon came to the conclusion that it was perhaps you know, some concerns needed to be expressed and to be to examined at the whole question of well integrity. And the report itself highlighted that as a particular issue that we felt needed attention. Um, obviously, um, we stressed at the time, and we will stress again today, it was not an exhaustive report. As the President has already said, it did not cover every angle. 
Um, it did not cover climate change at all, so today you know, we're pleased to see the report that has been published today. Um, obviously, as a group, I have to say we would be we're pleased to see the government's response to the report. But again, in our response, we stress the importance of well integrity and the critical aspect that part that that plays, if you like, in the whole possible industrial development. And of course, as the res quantification of the reserves increases and the possibility of greater numbers of, of wells increases, um, then those risks and those issues would need further consideration. We've the group as a whole, I think it's fair to say, we're keen to see on-site inspection taking place of the wells and the well integrity, um, except in the points that you made of the um, well-developed and robust um, environment that we have. In terms of today's speech, I think uh, you know, on behalf of the group, I could say we welcome being part of the debate. Um, the group itself never advocated a dash for gas. It began a very measured approach, I think, uh, um, a sort of an amber light, you know, you know, proceed with caution and care, and provided the two things really that really matter, provided the regulatory system is in place and is applied, and provided best practice is, is you know, is delivered by the industrial companies. Um, um, our main objective as two academies is, I think I'm fair to say, is to make sure that scientific and engineering evidence should play a key part in the debate, the discussions and the decisions. And as this debate goes forward, I think you know, everybody involved with the work would be very keen to see that happen, the evidence as it stands. And of course, it does develop as the exploration phase takes place. And finally, to say that you know, we were very conscious of the fact that we weren't addressing the public engagement issue. We made a recommendation in the report that, um, that that's where the greatest academic research needed to take place. So, Pleased to hear you say today there's in principle support from RCUK and quite keen to see that moving ahead, I suppose, as quickly as, as is humanly possible. So thank you. Well, thank you too, Hal. So um, we're now going to move to open up for questions from the audience. Um, some rules of engagement. Um, please state who you are and your affiliation. Please keep your questions concise. And should you do not, I will intervene. And thirdly, um, if appropriate, do direct um, questions to a particular panelist um, if you think that's appropriate. And um, we'll take two or three questions at a time, um, just so that we can get through um, um, more questions. So with that, um, over to you. I'll sort of start over here and work our, my way around. Yes, sir. Could you wait? Sorry. And please wait for a microphone. And maybe stand up, it would be good. I've got a laptop on my lap. I'm sorry, it's that Adam Vaughan from The Guardian. Um, given um, uh, the Secretary of State and um, uh, David Kennedy have both um, said that, uh, that it's clear that, not, that shale gas will not necessarily bring down energy bills, um, do they think that Lord Stern was correct to say that David Cameron's claim that they would is baseless? Is, it was, was Stern right to say that? Because obviously Cameron wrote quite a strong piece in the Telegraph in August, quite clearly saying that they did have the potential to do that, and now you're both saying it's unclear they will. Well, let's be clear what I'm saying. Uh, you, you want to, yeah, do, yeah, this yeah. To, to do this, is quite important. Um, I've been clear that if there's extra supply, it's going to be downward pressure on prices. But other things are happening at the same time, and the size of the markets are there. But increase in supply is always going to, as the Prime Minister was saying, have a downward pressure on prices. But you've got to look at the whole picture as well, and uh, I think uh, maybe that's the difference between what Professor Stern was saying and the Prime Minister. Uh, <coughs> I think Nick said the same thing as me, that in, in a market of 600 billion cubic metres, you bring 30 billion cubic metres of potentially a low-cost supply into that market, it doesn't change the price. I mean, fundamental economics says what changes the price in a market is the marginal cost of the marginal source of supply, to get a bit technical. Now, the marginal source of supply is likely to be LNG, and the, the cost of that is the cost of LNG. So we would expect to see a price that is largely unchanged because of shale gas in the future, unless there's a lot more shale gas in this country and in Europe, uh, so that the, the low price scenarios for the government in their report a few weeks ago uh, actually crystallise. So it becomes the dominant form of supply. But I don't think anyone's thinking that. So. Uh, we, we, we have said <laughs> pretty much the same thing. The economic argument is, is uh, uh, such that you would expect prices not to go down because of shale gas. 
So I broke my own rules and immediately asked only one <laughs> question. Sorry about that. Let's collect two or three, please. Just wait for the mic, and then we'll go over to you, OK? Thank you. Uh, Jane Thomas from Friends of the Earth. I'd like to pick up a point, Secretary of State, you said about renewables, and obviously welcome your commitment to support renewables. Um, we remain concerned about uh, investors, investor certainty in renewables and certainly mixed messages that have been coming from the government, not necessarily from yourself, but certain other senior members who have really used the dash for gas and failed really, I think, to inject that certainty. One of the things that I don't think has helped is about the planning regime, and this is a very specific question. I think it's really got to be a level playing field here. Um, this is the weekend when we see Quadrilla stopping having to stop drilling again for the second time, this time on a technicality of noise abatement. But uh, there's an issue of enforcement, but there's a real basic issue about level playing field. And I want to know why it's right for communities to be able to reject a wind farm and a communities not being able to reject having drilling. Thank you. Question here, I think. Yeah. Yes. Emily Beeman. Do stand up if you can. Yeah. Uh, Emily Beeman from the Press Association. This actually follows on from the previous question. In a, but in a, in a broader term, uh, given, you know, Mr. Davy, today you were very balanced in saying we need renewables and we also need gas and so on. Other parts of government don't seem to quite convey the same balance and this, this, they're very enthusiastic about a dash for gas. How do you ensure that investors um, on a broad scale don't take flight, particularly post-2020 when the landscape for support for renewables is not as certain as it is at the moment? Let's take those two questions together, actually, if we could. Can you just take this dash for gas uh, issue head on? We need a lot of gas power generation. Our proposals in, in DEC are for a lot of gas generation, a lot of new gas generation. Look at our gas generation strategy. Look at our carbon plan. So, you know, at the moment, we're, we're a sort of... Um, uh, I, we're not moving anywhere. We're not dashing. We're not even walking. We're not even crawling towards gas at the moment. There's not a lot of gas being built, and we need that, particularly to replace the, the gap in energy generation as coal plants uh, come off, because a lot of coal plants are coming off because of European regulation. So we're going to need uh, gas, and some people writing headlines might call that a dash for gas. I call it energy security, which is one of the reasons I'm in favour of shale gas. We have to have energy uh, security. So I think uh, the mixed messages don't actually come from the policy, from any uh, of the ministers. They come from how that is inter interpreted. Maybe it's something to do with spin doctors. I couldn't uh, possibly comment. Um, on this point, though, on uh, investor certainty, um, actually we are seeing, and inevitably there was a little bit of a hiatus before we uh, published the draft electricity market reform delivery plan in July, but the huge interest in uh, what we're doing is, is massive around the world. The numbers of applications we've had for the go early uh, contracts for difference, the investment contracts, has been huge. So um, I think the investors have moved on uh, fr from, from where they may have been a few months ago, and I'm very uh, cheered by that. And there is a complete level playing field on planning. Um, there may have been some spin doctor somewhere earlier this year saying communities had a veto against wind, wind farm applications. That is not true, never was, and it isn't going, going forward. The same planning system applies. Uh, and uh, the changes that were made, there's only one policy change that was made on the planning system for wind turbines, and that's to make a statutory requirement for pre-application consultation, which the vast majority of good wind farm developers already do. So there was a, I think the mixed messages are people believing spin doctors, not actually what was said uh, in terms of the policy proposals. Doug, do you want to comment on any of that or the dash for gas? Um, well, I mean, I think there is a nervousness out there. I mean, it was told to me again uh, only the other day. And um, it's not because the offshore wind industry, for example, has, a, has a, uh, you know, an interest in the outcome of the shale gas issue. I mean, I'm not sure that they do, actually. Uh, they just want to see an expansion of them, of, of their industry. But they are, they are nervous about the projections um, that have been in the national grid documents saying that there'll only be eight gigawatts by 2020 um, because we've got 
close to four already, there's another two being built, and that means there's only another two before the end of the decade. Well, that's a bit worrying, and that's not me saying that, because frankly, I hadn't noticed. Um, but um, they are, and they're worried about it. They're wondering, of where, you know, where's the volume towards the end of 2020s, and what about the post-2020 period? And if this is a strategic technology for the UK, where we're going to go for it, and we're going to corner the market, then that's a problem. Just very, very quickly then, because this is a, a, an issue which my organisation has raised. I, I think Ed's right that there is a lot of interest from investors putting money into the portfolio of low-carbon technologies in this country. But I think, Emily, you've picked up a, a, an important point as well, that they look at the, uh, the draft delivery plan for the electricity market reforms. They see a scenario in there that doesn't have any investment in offshore wind beyond 2020. I've spoken to every major investor since that delivery plan was published, they're all concerned at the moment. I haven't met one who's not about the very high degree of uncertainty. They are signed up for the process that Ed's talked about, but they are also concerned. And so certainly our organization uh, will consistently recommend, and uh, you will see we have written to Ed today our response on the EMR uh, delivery plan, where we say there is still a high degree of uncertainty. That is a problem. It needs to be addressed. And without addressing it, there is a risk to investment. So we need to make good on that very high degree of interest that Ed is as pointed to, but there is more to do there, uh, certainly as far as we're concerned. But again, we are just repeating the concerns of investors who we talk to uh, very frequently. Ed, uh, can I just respond to the points, because there are similar points uh, just made there. Um, first of all, the delivery plan, it only goes to 1819. It's only going for four years. So it was the delivery plan where you wouldn't expect it to give certainty in the 2020s, because it was never supposed to go to the 2020s. And investors have known that f f uh, all along. Uh, what I think should give them uh, real confidence is not only our 2020 targets, our uh, legal obligations to get 30% of our electricity at least uh, uh, from renewable electricity, that's what we are uh, saying, not just the fact that the UK government is out there as the most ambitious member state in the whole of the EU pressing on 2030 uh, targets, not only will be the first ever country to set a, a power set to decarbonisation target now in the energy bill because I uh, put it there. These are signs which ought to give people absolute confidence. The delivery plan was only ever supposed to go to 1819, so you can't really uh, argue that with respect to 20 confidence in 2020s. And the, the eight gigawatts of offshore wind, these are ranges. There's a whole set of ranges, and people t tend to pick the one at the bottom, not the one at the top, to make their point. And and, and, and there, are, there, are, there, are a lot, there are there are a lot of uh, assumptions behind those and that's why there's a range because people don't know what's going to happen to costs if offshore wind costs come down as i hope and believe they will uh, if you look at the offshore wind developers forum costs reduction report it's worth reading if you look at some of the results coming from the innovation r d work that we're funding it's quite clear that offshore wind costs could come down quite significantly and the more they come down the more offshore wind they will uh, be. So uh, I, I do pe uh, urge people, particularly the press, to go to the source and look at what the source is doing, because actually uh, that's uh, the policy. Good. Now we have um, questions. First of all, in the front here. Yeah, uh, Benny Pizer from the Global Warming Policy Foundation. Uh, I don't want to speculate about uh, the you know, shale resources and the impact on price. But there is a growing concern, you may have seen the Telegraph today in Brussels, that Europe is unable to sustain the gap between energy price in the US, which are about a third, I think, of what they are here, and that the green energy agenda in Europe, which no one else is picking up around the world, is essentially undermining uh, the industrial base of Europe. So. Uh, regardless of the speculation about shale, there is growing concern that companies are no longer investing. I'm not talking about relocation yet, but a lot of energy intensive companies no longer investing in Europe, even European companies going to the US and uh, benefiting from the low energy price. So unless, uh, and, and you may have seen that the uh, Energy Commission and the Industry Commission is, is increasingly concerned about the growing cost as a direct result of 
uh, the growth of renewable energy. So unless uh, Europe gets its act together, um, there will be a price in terms of um, heavy industry and energy intensive industry no longer being really interested in investing in Europe and possibly migrating to countries with lower energy prices. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other? Yes, a question. Yes, at the very back. Well, hello, uh, Ben Jackson from The Sun. A uh, question for Mr. Davey. Uh, are you and the Prime Minister of one mind on fracking? Yes. <laughs> Since the answer was short, I think we can take a third question in this um, trio, just there. Hi, um, Simon Lewis, Uni uh, University College London. Um, so I want, looking forward to the pivotal climate change talks in 2015 uh, in Paris, um, if we're exploiting unconventional fossil fuels, um, how are we supposed to play a leadership? What kind of leadership role can we play, particularly in terms of uh, rapidly developing countries, um, to make sure that we stick below two degrees C target? So maybe, Ed, if you could kick off on those questions. First of all, um, we should take uh, the competitiveness of Europe's industries very seriously. Um, uh, and if you look at what we're doing, other countries are doing, particularly for energy intensive industries, we're making sure that uh, some of the full costs of uh, the environmental policies they don't face. So uh, we in this country, if you look at the carbon costs of the carbon price floor, the costs of contracts for difference, the costs of the indirect costs of EU ETS, we're ensuring that energy intensive industries uh, aren't disadvantaged uh, through that. And we've had wide consultation and they've been welcomed uh, by uh, the industry. I'm not saying that's the, the full story, um, but then you've got to look on the other side of the equation. Actually, I disagree with you that other countries around the world outside Europe aren't taking this agenda seriously. Uh, if you listen to Obama and Kerry, if you look at the, what the new Chinese leadership is doing, I think people are moving far faster outside Europe than they are given uh, credit for. And we've got to encourage that and work with that. And I think Europe needs, therefore, to, yes, make sure our policies are, are carefully designed to make sure we don't see uh, carbon leakage, because carbon leakage is in no one's interest. Uh, um, you've got to make sure you minimise that, if you possibly can. But we've got to actually show uh, that you can make these adjustments and keep competitive. Uh, I established early this year something called the Green Growth Group, which is a group of EU ministers from like-minded uh, member states who share the UK's high ambition on climate change. And we are working with business, with parliament, uh, to show that there are real uh, benefits from going green, that uh, the green growth uh, is, if you design your policies right, is, is there as a prize. So um, I take those issues seriously, we must do, but actually uh, I, I think I come to a different conclusion. It's more about good policy design, it's more about international uh, cooperation uh, than uh, uh, turning our back on, t on dealing with a very serious issue with climate change. And which leads me on to responding to the point uh, from I think it was Simon. Um, we, we are showing leadership ahead of 2015 and we must continue. And I actually don't think this issue on shale gas really plays into that at all. Arguably, you could say it plays positively because the real problem, this is where I slightly differ from, from Doug, is the real problem is coal. I mean, you know, we, we are, what I worry about, as, uh, and, and my watch as Secretary of State for, for Energy and Climate Change, is because of the uh, America's uh, shale gas revolution, they push coal onto international markets, uh, and we're, we're using far more coal in Europe and the UK than we were before. That should really worry environmentalists. So actually, uh, we've got to tackle that, and shale gas is part of the answer to that, as is reforming the EUTS, the carbon market, as is getting ambitious 2030 uh, targets. So I don't think uh, ex uh, exploitation of shale gas prevents us being strong leaders in, year, in the EU on this agenda and strong leaders of the 2015 COP talks. And would you just like to say again to the sun the difference between you or not with the Prime the, Minister? There isn't any. There isn't any. Would you like to respond to any of this? Just, just very quickly. Uh, we in, in uh, the Committee on Climate Change have just started reviewing the fourth carbon budget. As part of that, 
I think Ed has said, at the heart of our strategy has to be a broader global agreement to reduce emissions. Otherwise, there's no point over time reducing emissions in this country. But we held a workshop to look at what's happening internationally uh, in the UN process, but also the various large emitting countries. And the very strong message that came from the experts at that workshop is that there are positive developments in major emitting countries. Ed said America, China, South Korea as well, Brazil, again, big emitting countries, acting very significantly. And, and this is more than was envisaged at the time we set the fourth carbon budget. Can I just say as well, I was pleased to hear you say, Benny, you weren't going to claim that because of low carbon policies, energy intensive industries have already relocated. Uh, certainly the facts and the evidence say that there hasn't been any relocation today. Uh, if we look forward again, my organization did a, a deep dive, a report on competitiveness impacts of low carbon policies. That was pretty clear. We should be concerned. We have to be concerned from a legal perspective, that's in the Climate Change Act, that when we advise on carbon budgets, we always have to think about affordability and competitiveness. We did a report on competitiveness. There are a few large electricity intensive industries in this country that if we didn't do anything, we'd be pretty worried about. So iron and steel is one of them. The government has acknowledged that. It's put policies in place and the uh, risk of leakage is minimal for those industries. Other countries are following suit. Germany has arrangements in place, Holland, other European countries. So it's an important point you make, but uh, the, the competitiveness risks can be managed and are being managed under the current policies. Good, okay. Uh, here, first, please. Uh, Tim Webb from The Times. A uh, question Do for um, uh, Davey. Um, I mean, on the dash for gas issue, um, yes, y you're not saying you're against the dash for gas, and I agree that lots of Gas plants need to be built based on your own uh, planning, but I think uh, your scenarios, but the difference I think, which I'm sure David Kennedy would, would kind of point out, is, uh, is how much these gas plants are actually used, you know, whether they're just used as backup or whether in the 2020s they're, they're kind of um, more providing base load. And isn't there a danger that um, if we do start producing a lot of shale gas, you know, 34 BCM or more, and it's kind of might result in slightly lower bills than would otherwise be, if, we, if we're producing more gas than we actually need for these gas plants, if they are to act as backup to wind farms, then the, the pu from a public's point of view, the public acceptance, you know, that, that we somehow start exporting this gas overseas because we're, we're, we've built all these gas plants, but we're hardly ever using them because they're just as backup for wind farms. Do you think, you know, if we shale gas does take off, there'll be much more of a pressure to use gas plants more and potentially break these carbon targets? So they, these, this dash for gas would indeed be a proper dash for gas and gas plants would be used a lot of the time rather than just as backup as you, I think, intend. There's a question here. Thanks. Emily Gosden from The Telegraph. Um, Ed Davey, you mentioned having, I think, the strongest regulation uh, in the world so that shale gas can happen safely. Uh, but we seem to have seen quite a lot of um, uncertainty and changes in the regulation thus far. I think Friends of the Earth have twice made Quadrilla change their plans in Balkan, which admittedly isn't shale gas. But I think you said it as well, the EA is looking at reviewing some of the... Uh, uh, permitting rules. When will everything be ready so there is a concrete set of regulations for shale gas, <coughs> shale gas drilling? And will you consider uh, asking operators to wait until that set of regulations is ready before they proceed with any drilling? And a third question here, please. Um, yeah, J uh, Julia Guidi from JP Morgan. Uh, the question is how uh, the government is planning to educate the general public on environmental issues that can, um, c how can they be controlled? I think it's over to you again, Ed. I thought it might be. Um, well, f first of all, carbon targets are the law. We have the Climate Change Act. It's a legal obligation. It's not a, a, a choice. So uh, we are upholding our legal obligations. We're making all the changes so we can meet them and can meet them uh, with confidence. So uh, I think that's my first uh, response to you. Um, I think, Tim, in your question, you had a lot of assumptions. Uh, you had the assumption uh, that there was going to be some, a very positive price effect. Um, there, was assumption, there weren't assumptions about the price of carbon. Um, I mean, uh, I strongly uh, am working, uh, believe and am working for uh, reforming the EUETS. Uh, so the, the Europe's carbon market can actually send the signals. That has an impact, potentially over above the carbon price floor. So all these things have to be uh, factored in. So uh, I don't see the concerns uh, uh, materialising that you suggest. 
Um, Emily, on regulation. First of all, these are early days in the, the shale gas exploration. <coughs> Uh, we've done a huge amount on regulations, and many of the regulations that were already in existence before shale gas was being debated will be applying to shale gas. You know, because we've been uh, managing the oil and gas industry in the UK for decades. Uh, I mean, the regulation regime that we use for oil and gas exploration production in the North Sea is extremely strong. Um, we have a, a regulation reg regime that's looked at uh, on, onshore uh, oil production for many years. So for some people, this may be something like it's a new thing. We're having to reinvent the wheel. F far from it. We've got to make sure, uh, and this is where I'm uh, uh, determined uh, on, we've got to make sure that uh, that regime is fit for purpose for the Pacific task of uh, hydraulic fracturing, which is why the Royal Society's report was so important, which is why... Professor Mackay is important, particularly for methane uh, emissions. But I don't think it's, uh, you can say that we're creating huge uncertainty in regulations, and that's a huge problem for uh, shale gas uh, developers. We are trying to give, in the very early days, uh, certainty. We're trying to give incentives. If you look at the uh, tax consultation from the Treasury, uh, you know, we are trying to give uh, uh, clarity there and the Office for Unconventional Gas and Oil which is in my department is doing that as well so uh, I, I don't I don't recognize this uh, huge problem that you are, are putting forward uh, Judy for, for how do you educate uh, the public well um, you've got to first of all be frank and open with them and transparent um, and engage in the debate uh, uh, last week I was doing re uh, Five Lives Energy Day up in Manchester and they did a huge poll uh, they commissioned of uh, a whole set of energy issues including fracking and what that poll showed was the uh, lack of uh, understanding or even awareness of fracking in the wider public but for those who were more aware who had actually read something about it they were much more positive towards fracking isn't that that's quite interesting the ones who were less aware, who learned less, were, were worried. It sounds awful, fragging. But the ones who had actually engaged were much more positive towards it and understood it better. So part of today's uh, event and the speech and the work we're doing is to try to make, help more people become aware. And I think if we put in place uh, the strong regulations, uh, whether it's with respect to water sustainability or contamination, whether it's with respect to well integrity with the independent well examiners, <coughs> whether it's with respect to methane emissions controls and, and so on, then when people look at this issue, they will be able to say, yeah, the government's uh, met all the concerns I might, might have had. Any other comments from any panellists? Don't. Well, just, just briefly, I mean, uh, I think what Tim is, is pointing at is something that I worry about, um, which is that the fossil fuel industry is traditionally pretty good at getting what it wants. And we're on the, on the point of creating a new fossil fuel industry that will fight very hard for what it wants. Um, I don't think we can be blasé about the idea that our current set of regulations, our current set of commitments, even our current set of laws are somehow enduring and everlasting and that they will be, um, they are set in stone because unfortunately I don't think they are. Um, it's 10 years ago that uh, I remember a Secretary of State, um, not exactly Ed Davies' predecessor, but another one saying, um, the only future for the UK pretty much is in energy efficiency and renewables, and we completely concurred. Um, but things have moved on since then, and it doesn't look like that anymore. So, um, and actually, um, I, I agree that coal is really bad, and we want to see coal phased out, and I'm actually rather worried that our current set of coal plants are going to keep, uh, keep going for much longer than is currently anticipated, because those operators want to make sure that they do. And that's another example. Here is an energy industry, a high-carbon industry, that is going to try and get what it wants and is fighting to get it. <coughs> so I say the only way to deal with that is not to allow the creation of those things in the first place. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Yes. Uh, Neil Hutt from Grant 
Could you wait for the mic? It's there. Neil Hurst from the Grantham Institute Imperial College. Uh, Minister, you rightly made the point that for the future, shale gas is only going to be compatible, compatible with our environmental objectives if we have CCS. And you said, memorably, the government is head, heart, and wallet behind CCS. Uh, the government has done a lot, I believe, in terms of R&D and is doing, and in terms of developing regulation, which is very, very important. But the story on full-scale demonstration is pretty sad. I mean, the word, going back to the previous government, by the way, there were going to be four projects in the UK. This dwindled to one. This crashed with the Longanit proposal. Then we were told there was going to be a new one. Everyone was expecting a project to be chosen, but for some reason, which may be a good one, the government decided no to carry on with design work on two alternative projects. I think the government is behind already the schedule that was set in the roadmap. Uh, could I just press, you know, what is the timetable now for having a full-scale demonstration plant? And how, how does that fit in the Minister's view with the timetable when we might actually have commercial CCS plant in the UK? One more question here, and then, then we should stop. Uh, Ron Oxborough, independent member of the House of Lords, uh, and more relevantly, formerly of geologist and formerly of Shell. Um, I, I, I'm not a known supporter of the government in many ways, but I actually happen to think that the government has got it about right in this. But to pick up a uh, point of Ed Davies, and I think an earlier point of uh, Doug Parr's, you can have the very best regulation in the world, the most modern, the most perceptive, but unless you have appropriate support for its implementation on the ground, uh, you're wasting your time. So could we, could the Secretary of State possibly give us an assurance that there will indeed be resource to ensure that the regulations are properly and effectively enforced? Over to you. Um, on CCS, first of all, um, uh, I, I actually rather more optimistic than you, both in terms of the time scale and uh, how the technology will go. I don't have a crystal ball, uh, but nevertheless, let me try to uh, reassure you. Uh, with the Peterhead and the White Rose uh, project, we're obviously still finalising negotiations to agree the contract for the front end engineering design phase, uh, but hopefully we'll have announcements soon to make on those, and that will give, I hope, you the reassurance that you seek. Uh, and we, we, people think we've taken a little bit longer, but it's because we're learning lessons from the past. And we have not only uh, got the two preferred bidders, but we've got reserve bidders, so there's more competitive pressure uh, throughout the process. So I think we have learned a lot of the lessons from the past, and I think uh, we are uh, you know, proceeding well. Um, I also see examples of new technology and new ideas that will link into the CCS uh, uh, revolution, uh, which give me really, really uh, good hope and optimistic, uh, both particularly in this country, but actually also uh, with the international cooperation, what we're seeing in some other countries too. So I think the CCS story is, a, is, a, is actually a good story. Uh, Ron's uh, point is, is, of course, a very valid point. If you have all the laws and regulations you like, but they're not enforced, uh, they're, they're meaningless. I mean, um, uh, we are determined to make sure that those regulations are enforced uh, because we are at very early stages. I mean, there's not a huge amount happening out there because we are at the early stages of exploration. So, uh, you know, if we're talking about production in 2018 19, uh, any reassurance I gave you, Secretary of State, may not be worth because I may not be Secretary of State in 2018 19. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, just to say, on I think, Neil, you're right, there, there have been a lot of delays on CCS over the last few years, but I think. Uh, first of all, the funding for CCS remained intact through the spending review. I think that was a great outcome. It was under, under pressure there. It, it, it survived. Second, the process has now moved forward. We've got two viable projects identified and moving forward. And uh, there is the prospect of having those two projects coming on the system uh, this decade with further investments coming on the system and the technology being proven in the 2020s. It's an important technology and we should continue to back it. We are doing it at the moment. So I have to close um, the, d the debate there, um, but I'd just like to make uh, two short comments. The first, I think it's very welcome that the Coalition and the Secretary of State has um, opened up a national debate 
with this speech today on this very important issue. And I think um, that's a very um, welcome development. And the second point about the role of um, science and scientific advice and technological advice in policy development. It's very important that we get high quality scientific advice, free of politics, free of ideology, out there to inform the subsequent political debate. And that's exactly what we try to do here at the Royal Society and exactly how um, I think the Secretary of State has responded to that. So thank you, Secretary of State. Thank you, panelists. And good luck with the debate. Thank you. Thank you.